I want to welcome to uh, Easter Sunday service. This is a 930 service on Sunday for our congregation who are uh, under the edict of stay home. And so we're bringing this to you uh, from doctrinal studies out of Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, we're going to bring uh, out of our series our second lesson on uh, Messianic Passover. And we're going to close our service today. We're going to close our service today uh, with the Easter Eucharist that our congregation will take at home with us. Uh, so for those of our congregation and for others who would like to do it, uh, get you some juice and a cracker at the end of the service. We'll take part in this Eucharist together. Uh, Glenda Wolliver, a member of our congregation, uh, suggested that she thought it'd be a good way to connect our body together. Uh, and uh, I thought that was a great suggestion. And so we want to do that right after our service today. Today, I want to talk about the day of preparation uh, during the Passover week. Uh, you'll recall from last week, Passover is the 14th of Niacin. It's a date, not a day. The 14th of Niacin. And um, then you, following that day, you have a seven days of what's called unleavened bread. In the middle of that week or after the Saturday weekly Sabbath of that week, you begin to, that's first fruits, the first day of the week in unleavened bread becomes the day after the Sabbath, becomes first fruits. And you begin counting seven complete Sabbaths until the 50th day. That's Pentecost, or the Hebrews, the Jewish people, call it the, the Feast of Weeks, the seven weeks, 50 days. And so one of the great problems of confusion of, for example, today, we're going to explain to you from the Word of God the mistake that people make when they say Jesus would died on Friday, was buried on Saturday, and was raised on Sunday. The only part of that that is accurate in the eight-day festival is that he was raised on Sunday. Up from the grave, he arose. The angel said, he is not here, he is risen. That's the only accurate part of that whole scenario. And I'm going to explain to you today what they've missed, what they've missed in this whole story, how they got their count wrong, uh, in my opinion. And we will explain to you theologically, it's all due to what the Bible calls the day of preparation. This is where they make their mistake in my observation of it. And so we're going to talk about the day of preparation if you have your Bibles, I want you to open them to John 19. I'm going to read uh, my passage, and then we're going to have a word of prayer, and I'm going to get into an explanation of that from the Word of God. Now, what people say, what does the Bible say about it? Well, here we are in John 9, 13, 9, 13, uh, 19, chapter verse 30 is where I want to begin. When Jesus is on the cross and he's at his very end of his work for the salvation of mankind, and Jesus, therefore, had received the sour wine. He said, it is finished. He bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. It is finished. The work of salvation was finished. And he bowed his head. He said, no man takes my life from me earlier in John. He said, no man takes my life from me. I voluntarily give it back to the father. And so that's the point. Now watch verse 31. Now today I'm going to explain where the mistakes are made in this. The Jews, therefore, because it was or since it was the day of preparation, so that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath, the day, the day they're concerned about, for that Sabbath was a high Sabbath. We know that Jesus died on Passover, nice and 14. That's when the Lamb of God was sacrificed. We know that. 
we know that the next day, the 15th of niacin to the 21st is unleavened bread. And we know from Leviticus 23 that the first day of unleavened bread and the last day of unleavened bread were holy convocations or Sabbaths, even though they weren't weekly. They were identified under the same rules and regulations of a weekly Sabbath, no work, etc. They're called high Sabbath. In this text, the word for high is used as megas. And in Leviticus, they're called, in the English, they're called holy convocations. He says, for that Sabbath, the 15th of Niacin, was a high Sabbath. And so the Jewish people that crucified Christ asked Pilate that the legs, that their legs would be broken, that they might be taken away. Why? Because the next day was a high Sabbath. And this breaking their legs and, and death would destroy the unleavened bread ceremony. They, they would be unclean. And so the soldiers, verse 32, the soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man. You know, there were three crosses. Came to the first cross and uh, broke the legs of that man and of the other man who was crucified with him. In other words, you always see the three crosses on the hill of Golgotha and Jesus in the middle. We know that from how he talked to them. <coughs> the soldiers <coughs> sent by Pilate broke the legs of the first one, went over, walked past Christ, and broke the legs of the other thief. <coughs> That's important you understand that. And the other who was crucified with him. But coming to Jesus, coming back and taking a good look at Jesus, when they saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But to be sure, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and he, immediately there came out blood and water. That was a sign that he was dead. Now, we knew he was dead from verse 30. Before the two others died, he bowed his head. Voluntarily gave up his spirit. Verse 35. And he who has seen has borne witness, talking about John, and his witness is, tr is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth so that you also may believe. That's John speaking. He's the writer. For these things came to pass that the scriptures might be fulfilled. Not a bone of him shall be broken. That's out of Leviticus 23. A la the, lamb, the lamb that was used for sacrifice for sin in Israel at Passover, the Passover lamb... 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Jesus, the Passover lamb, the lamb that was used for sacrifice, not a bone could be broken or it was uncleaned and couldn't be used. That's out of Leviticus. They're quoting Leviticus 23. And Jesus is fulfilling it. All the rules and regulations of Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, Jesus has to fulfill. He said, I, came, I didn't come to destroy, I came to fulfill. And again, another scripture, they shall look on him who they've pierced. Another, this one from Zechariah. Another scripture, messianic. Another messianic scripture. And I want to stop right there because I've got what I'm after, the day of preparation. Let's pray. Before we pray, let me tell you, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual living. You can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin in a Christian's life. It could be mental attitude type sins, sins of the tongue or overt sins, just to give you an example. How do you get out of carnality and back into spirituality of 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3? 
Here's how. You have to confess your personal sin. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, if, maybe you will, maybe you won't, but you don't get the second part if you don't get the first part. You're carnal. And how are you going to get cleansed from your sin and be restored to spirituality? If you confess your sin, if you name it and cite it to God, he will forgive you and cleanse you from sin. That takes you back to verse 7 where Christ on the cross cleansed you not only from Adam's sin that separated you from God in time. All men are under Adam's sin. But it, as well as that, it cleanses the believer from the carnality sin and puts him back into spirituality. Not salvation, that's done. Spirituality is the issue. Carnality and spirituality, 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3. When you confess your sin, you're back into spirituality. Why is that important in Bible study? Well, listen, John 14, 26, the Holy Spirit will teach and recall the word of God from your life will make you not only a student of the word, but a teacher of it, a teacher of truth. You've got to learn it in order to give it. And so I bring it to you today. Let's have prayer, and you get yourself prepared for the study of God's word to explain to you from a biblical standpoint so you can explain it to someone else why Jesus did not die on Friday, buried on Saturday, and rose on Sunday. That's not... That's not the three days that the Bible talks about. And it's a mistake over not understanding the day of preparation. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you today for these that have come with us by the Internet. I pray for our congregation today, Father, that th this would be a time of great healing within a family and marriages, <clears throat> neighborhoods, a great ministry opportunity on our Wednesday program. Father, let not your hearts be troubled. We're trying to encourage our people to have ministry to people that are in need and, and are hurting. And we're dealing with different possibilities every Wednesday at 1130. But today, Father, we look at a mistake, even by wonderful Ryrie's Bible. I just love this Bible made a mistake about it. They think it was a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday deal. That, that, that disturbs my soul greatly because it is very clear that that's not true in the Bible. The Bible. And we'll certainly <clears throat> expose every bit of the Bible on this issue today. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> well, in looking at our passage here, I want you to go back with me to verse 31. The Jews, therefore, in our first point today in our lesson out of John 19, 30 through 37, Jesus, the text that we have says that the Jews, therefore, the Jews. The word in the Greek language is un, and in my congregation understands that when you see the word therefore, you ask why for why is therefore, we're always referring to something ahead of it. Something has been said that is important to the passage we're in. The, what has been said before is the final words of Jesus from the cross, it is finished. The teleastai, it's in the perfect tense, meaning that work is done and is done forever. It was done on the, it was done, uh, on the cross on the hill called Golgotha, and that work is completed. Therefore, by grace we're saved through faith and not of herself as a gift of God, not of works. All the work was done by Christ on the cross. It is finished. When we get saved, we enter into a finished work of salvation. That's the perfect tense of Tetelestai. Now, what is prior to that is dealing with a crucifixion. We know, and we've, see, we've st already studied two other lessons we, on this subject. We know that that's Passover. From Exodus, the 12th chapter, where, Pen where uh, Passover came from, the whole idea, and we explained that it was the Passover angel, and the Passover, and the Passover, the lamb 
a lamb selected, a perfect lamb based on birth and growth. First Peter talks about that. First Peter 1, 18, 19 talks about that very thing. <clears throat> was slain. His blood, the blood was put over the doorpost of the home. And when the death angel passed over, the blood secured the life of the residents. The blood of Christ is where our salvation security is. That's the picture. When the death angel passed over, he looked. And if there was blood over the doorpost, spared. If there wasn't, the firstborn of man and animal died. That's Passover. That's Exodus, the 12th chapter. That's where the word Passover comes from. It was on Passover. The lamb was slain. The blood secured Israel. The blood secured wherever the blood was. If it was on an Egyptian home that understood the importance of the blood. When the Exodus came, not only did Israel leave, but many, many, many that lived in Egypt, which were not Jewish by birth, left with them. The influence of the gospel of Christ, like Galatians 3.8. And so when it says, therefore, then we go back to really understand that it was during Passover, the 14th of Niacin, when the Lamb of God was slain, his blood secures everyone who believes. Therefore, since it was the day of preparation. So what is that? That's Passover. Passover was a time to prepare for the exodus. That's the unleavened bread. Let me say that again. Passover was the day of preparation for the seven-day festival. Passover being one day. Unleavened bread, Leviticus 23, seven-day festival, unleavened bread. Therefore, since it was the day of preparation, so that the body should not remain on the cross on the, on, on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath, the next day, the Jewish day went from 6 to 6, the next day, and they've got a, th a three-hour window. Jesus is going to die at three. And he's got to be off that cross and in a grave before six. Now, just a Jewish law. So that the body should not remain on the cross uh, on the Sabbath. That's all three of them. For the Sabbath was a high, a mega, the day. That, that word he, himera, is the day. That's the high Sabbath day, was a holy day. A high Sabbath was a holy day. It was viewed like, like a weekly Sabbath. It wasn't. It was a holy convocation. The Jews, the Jews, therefore, these Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. You see, that's John 19.31 the reference to all of what they're doing is out of Exodus, the 12th chapter, 14 through 9, 19, and 33 through 39 would give you a good look at that. As we saw in the reading of our text, John 19, 32 through 36, Pilate agreed to their demand. He agreed to their demand. I read that earlier. I want you to go back later and read it and keep two questions in mind. Remember, now, this is the 19th, this is the 14th day of Nisan. It's Passover, also called the day of preparation to begin the seven-day feast of unleavened bread. Two questions. The first question, do you suppose these Jewish religious leaders understood the Passover rule about not breaking the bones of the animal, uh, the lamb of God uh, on Passover. You suppose they, I'm just asking you, do you suppose they knew Exodus 12? 
They're celebrating the Passover, and they're, they're nitpicking on it. Of course they do. That's why they requested the legs be broke and these people be buried before the, the, the six, 6 o'clock. They're in a rush to get this done. Of course they understood it. Of course they understood the rules of getting them off the cross. They've got to die. We don't have time to let them die on their own. They've got to die. Go break their legs, they'll die. They've been hanging there all day. Break their legs, they'll die. They come to Jesus, he was already dead, verse 30. So they didn't break his legs. So that brings the second question. Isn't it interesting that they were, they, when they got to Jesus, they couldn't break his legs? Why? Because God protected him. Listen, the blood has covered him. Now think about that for a minute. It covered for the doorpost. It covered him. The blood covered him. When they got to him, the whole point was death. When they got to him, he was already dead, just to be sure they checked it out by putting a spear in his side. And what came out was the serum of death. That's on the 14th of Niacin. Did these Jews understand John the Baptist's claim when he declared Jesus of Nazareth the prophetic lamb of God that had come to save their people from their sins. Do you suppose they understood? Do you suppose they understood? They hadn't had a prophet in Israel for 400 years. When John came, they all, everybody in the nation knew that John the Baptist was a prophet sent from God. You get that? They knew he taught that. But they didn't believe it. Like many of you, you don't understand how important salvation is to your destiny. Not just your destiny in the future when you die, go to heaven. Your destiny in now, in real time countdown how important your life is to God to be lived in front of other humanity, people that you know that need Christ as badly as you, and they will listen to you. I'm just saying, that's how it worked in my life. Did, they, did the people know that the pro God had sent a prophet after 400 years that they were listening to the words that this man said. They were writing them down and recording them for history. Of course they did. But they didn't believe the prophet. They didn't believe the prophet when he said, this man is going to fulfill shadow Christology. He is the Lamb of God that's come to take away the sin of the world. Did they believe it? No, they didn't. What's the evidence? They put him to death. And they would have broke his legs had he not been dead, had God not covered Jesus with his own blood in the plan of God, they would have broke his leg. If they'd have thought about it earlier, they probably would have requested it. That's the problem with unbelief. A day short and a dollar. Boy, don't let that happen in your life and you wind up in hell. You see, they know a lot more than they're telling you. They are already upset with Pilate for writing on the cross of Jesus, Jesus the Nazarene, the king of the Jews. They're already upset with him. Did Herod believe that Jesus was the king of the Jews? <laughs> yeah, I bet he did not for his salvation, but to murder all the children under two in Bethlehem. Do these religious Jews know that? 
Yes, one of their chief leaders, spiritual leaders, was a guy called Annas, who was the high priest. And now he's got Caiaphas' son in law. My, my, my people. I'll tell you, when you're lost, you're blind. Not only are you spiritually dead, but you're spiritually blind. You can't see the truth when it bites you. They had already, by the time of the crucifixion, they had already plotted against working to destroy Jesus in John 19, 19 through 22. And what was their motive? This man that went around and did only good. What was their motive? Caiaphas in John 18, 14 gives us a clue. It is expedient for one man to die on behalf of the rest of us. The truth of the matter is, they didn't really know. Listen, that one man did die on behalf of everybody else. You see, when you're spiritually blind, you can't see the truth if it bites you. This one's going to bite them. If you want to read more about the betrayal and how they were engaged months ahead of time, you can read John 11, 47 through 51, where they, they bought uh, Judas's carrot, an inside disciple, for the betrayal. Je Jesus at the Last Supper in John 13, 21 through 30, in the Last Supper, exposed the betrayer. He said, the one who dips the morsel, the bread, the morsel piece of bread in this fruit. Is my betrayer. My, my. My, my. In Matthew, the 27th chapter, 1 through 10, Judas is remorseful over betraying him because he's been played the sucker by the religious crowd. I'll tell you, if there's anything in this world that is more evil than religion, I'd like to have you point it out. Because they go after the good of the community as well as the bad. They'll overlook the bad. Listen, the two priests in the, in the parable of the Samaritan, the two priests who should have been looking out for the needs of mankind went across, walked around them. Not to get their hands dirty. That's religion. You would have thought they would have rushed to the scene. to help a man who had been attacked by evil and do good. The whole story was about doing good, being merciful, good. Religion, they cover up evil. Oh, gosh, people, people, people. Don't let the truth bite you and send you to hell, man. In spite of all this plotting against the plan of God, the plan of God moved forward on schedule. Isaiah 54, 17. Well worth your read in the crisis we're in now. It don't matter. It doesn't matter. Everybody's all upset about this virus. This virus doesn't have power over the plan of God. It has no power over the plan of God in your life. They don't have the power of death over a believer's life. That power has been taken away. Wherefore, by one man sin of the world and death by sin, and so death has passed upon all men, both spiritual and physically. Listen, in Christ, that's over. Go back and read John 11 and the, and the messages that he brought to the funeral of Lazarus, both to Mary and Martha. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection. There's no medicine that can do that. Medicine is for the unbelieving world to keep them alive long enough to get them saved. Where well, that's not a worry. Death is not a worry. Disease is not a worry. They both come from Adam's sin. This doesn't bother us.
And if it does, pay attention to my Wednesday study. Here's number two. Following the Babylonian captivity, 586 B.C., Israel goes under divine discipline of Leviticus 26 to Babylon, the fifth cycle of divine discipline to the priest nation of Israel. There are, four, there are 70 years in captivity. They come back in 516, build a temple, and away they go. I just want to give you that picture because these returning Jews combined Passover, the Passover holiday or holy day. Holiday is a holy day. You do know that's what holiday means. It means a holy day. You know, the unbelieving world don't know it. They, listen, they wouldn't know the truth if it bit them. But we know that. The word holiday means holy day. You know, they try to take our Christmas from us. They try to take everything from us. All they do is to take it away from themselves. They can't take what we have. They, all they do is destroy the truth for themselves. The returning Jewish leaders combined Passover with unleavened bread one day with seven days and just called it one festival. Sometimes it's called Passover and sometimes unleavened bread. It's now an eight-day ceremony. By the time of Jesus Christ, these names were used interchangeably for this eight day. Like Luke 22. Just drop back to Luke 22 with me for just a moment. Back to Luke 22 or to Luke 20. Listen to what he says. They, see, these are interchangeable. Now the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is called the Passover, was approaching. You see, sometimes they referred to this eight-day festival as Passover, and sometimes they referred to it as the one day. Sometimes they referred to the eight days as unleavened bread, and sometimes they referred to it as the seven days. Leviticus tells you Passover is one day, 14, and unleavened bread is 15 through 21. Le Leviticus 23. No, you, you have to open your Bible and study. You do know that. <laughs> Come on, people. You'll always, you'll always be in the dark if you don't open the Bible for the light of revelation. These names became interchangeable. When in the second, 22nd chapter down into verse 7, then it came the first day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. See, that could be confusing. That could be confusing if you didn't understand the history and understand its origin. It began in Leviticus, it began in Exodus 12, actually, and it's described in Leviticus in detail. Oh, boy. You know, you have to be a student of the Word of God. I'm telling you, if you read all this, we'll all understand it. There'll be no mistake about it. In last week's lesson... We learned that the Passover occurs on Nisan 14, which is a date, not a day. We also learned that unleavened bread was seven days, went from the 15th to the 21st. Dates, not days. During the time, the, during, during this time, the Jews, during the time of Christ, the Jews used the term day of preparation interchangeably, as we've just seen. They used it interchangeably. They did it when you read John 19 or Matthew 26. They did this, in, or Luke 22. To keep your head straight about it, you have to study Leviticus 23, where they lay out the instructions. Where did the idea come from that Jesus died on Friday, buried on Saturday, and raised on Sunday. This is where it came from. This is where it came from. Listen, and it's lazy theology. Lazy theology. Study for yourself. Prove me wrong. Or prove me right. You're going to have to open your Bible, and you're going to have to study.
my third point. It came from a failure to study the history of Messianic history and the connection between four Messianic holidays in this eight-day period. Three of them in it, and the fourth is connected to it. You have Passover on the 14th, unleavened bread, 15 through 21. In the middle of that unleavened bread, seven days, there's a weekly Sabbath. A weekly Sabbath. Remember the first day and the last day are holy convocations. They're Sabbaths, but they're called high Sabbaths or holy convocations. In the middle of these two is a third called the weekly Sabbath. That's a normal Sabbath of a week. The next day, which is the first day of the week of unleavened bread. Now get this. I want you to get this. It's called first fruits. Whoa. First fruits is what we call Sunday as when Jesus was raised from the dead. Now watch this. The day prior to that was the weekly Sabbath. But prior to that was a holy convocation on the 15th. And when Jesus died on a cross, they broke the legs and they were concerned because the, the 15th of Niacin is going to begin at 6 o'clock, 6 p.m., and it's three. And they've got to have everybody buried and cleaned up before, because the, because the first day of unleavened bread is a high Sabbath, John 19, 31. Now, when we get over here to the first day, uh, the, Leviticus, Leviticus 23 tells you that the day after the weekly Sabbath, is first fruits. And you start counting, you count from there, you count seven complete Sabbath weeks. And the 50th day is Pentecost or the Feast of Weeks. It's called week, it's called the Feast of Weeks because of the seven weeks. Pentecost, that's Acts 2. Do you have that? Study of Leviticus 23. The day of preparation occurs on the Passover after the lamb is slain, and that is over. They begin the preparation for the unleavened bread. They are getting ready for this. They're getting ready to visualize the exodus. During the unleavened bread of seven days, there are two high Sabbaths, which are dates, not days. And there is one weekly Sabbath, which is a day, not a date. <laughs> I know by now your head is spinning, and I don't expect you to get it all today. I expect you to study it until you get it, because I've laid out all of the information on the, on, on the paper. You can, if you didn't get a study guide, you just go to our website, doctrinalstudies.com. You can get it, and you will need it. Now, I'll tell you something. Paul knew this. Paul saw the connection. Paul, in 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 23, Paul refers to Jesus Christ as the first fruits of the resurrection. Where did he get that idea? <laughs> How about that? How about that? How about that, people? Also mentioned in Acts 26, 23. You've got to keep the eye, your eye on the four Old Covenant Messianic festivals, Passover, Unleavened Bread, First Fruit, and the Feast of Weeks called Pentecost. In Leviticus 23, 4, 
God tells us ahead of time before we studied all of these, these are the appointed times of the Lord. Holy convocations which you shall proclaim at the times appointed for them. I just did that. I went back and did that. I went back and did that. On Passover, nice and the 14th, Jesus died on a cross. It was Wednesday. Wednesday. Unleavened bread, 15 through 21, is going to involve the burial and resurrection of Christ. He's going to be buried three days according to Matthew 12, 38 through 40, and 1 John 2, 19 through 22. Three days and three nights. Three days and three nights. You know what it is? Check into a hotel and see how you pay. Three days and three nights. Three days and three nights. He dies on 14th. On 15th, he, he's buried because they were worried about it. So he was buried. He is buried. 15, that's Thursday. Buried Friday, the 16th. Buried Saturday, the weekly Sabbath, 17th. And he's out of the grave on the 18th, the first day of the week or our Sunday. He's the first fruits of the resurrection. Jesus began a post, a post resurrection appearances after his resurrection. And he's going to do it for 40 days while we're counting down to Pentecost. From his resurrection, we're counting down 50 days. We're told in Acts 1, he's going to leave after 40 days. Going to breathe the Holy Spirit upon the disciples just to keep him in line until Pentecost come when they could be indwelt. They can't, that's not going to happen. The Holy Spirit is not going to come until Pentecost. He's got to return to the Father, be seated, and then be able to be the executor, the one who who uh, gives the proper orders. From the Messianic first fruits resurrection of Jesus Christ on Sunday, you count seven Sabbath weeks until the, till you have the Feast of Weeks, or what we call now Pentecost, and you know what you have? Sunday. <laughs> you have Sunday. It is because of these two events the resurrection of Jesus Christ in the beginning of the church at Pentecost. That Sunday, the first day of the week, is when we celebrate in the Christian church. It's when we take part in the Eucharist. Acts 20, verse 7. So we're going to do that now. If you'll, if you'll get your, your cup, your bread in your cup, you need your bread in your cup, a little piece of cracker or some juice. God knows what we got. And I'm going to turn to 1 Corinthians. And I'm, we're going to take part in, a, in a, a marvelous ceremony today. Of 1 Corinthians 11. This comes out of the Last Supper of Luke 22. I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he given thanks, he broke it and he said, this is my body. This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. See, that's the first participation. First part of the ceremony is to understand the importance of the bread. Now, we're, we're, we're going to take it. I got a little piece of bread here. But that piece of bread represents the body of Christ that bore our sins on the cross. The Lamb of God who had come to take away the sin of the world. 
And the power of that is as much as the, when the blood was put over then, the death angel went over and everybody was spared. Let me tell you, that blood over your life, when the death angel comes over your life, your blood will secure you. Why? Because the body of Christ, virgin born, virgin born, actually virgin conceived, virgin conceived, conceived of the Holy Spirit, Luke 1, 34 and 35. The hypostatic man is born on the earth through a woman called Mary. Undiminished deity, undiminished deity and true humanity and one unique man of the universe, born the only begotten son of God for one purpose, for one purpose, and that was his body to go to a cross and hang there for the sins of the world and the punishment and the judgment of all sin. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. As a result, 40 days after his resurrection, he sent it back to the Father and seated at the right hand of God the Father, and his body takes on a new purpose to me as a believer. Everything that he is, I become. Everything that he is in his resurrection body, I become in my physical body. Think about that. He's a son, I'm a son. He's eternal life, I'm eternal life. He's a priest, I'm a priest. He's an heir, I'm an heir. Her inheritance, inheritance, and the list just goes on. And I'm so thankful that that's a representative. Do this in remembrance of me. Can we do that? Can we do that? Let's do that right now. Chew it all. Chew it all good. Don't swallow no hunks. He was on that cross nine to three. Eat it all. Chew it up very well. And Father, we thank you. What an offering from heaven to us to secure our life for time and eternity. You talk about frontline workers, and we've seen some heroes, none as great as this. For the sins of humanity of all time, Adam's sin and personal sin taken care of in one moment of time in great anguish as separation. And we thank you for it. Then he, he picks up the cup in 11, 1 Corinthians 11. In the same way he took the cup. This is the old, this is old, this is a Passover cup he said, this cup is now the new covenant in my blood. He, he picked up the old covenant, Passover, and he says, there's an exchange. No longer considered to be shadow Christology cup. Like in Hebrews 10.1. No, no. This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me, as often as you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. And what is that? Listen, that's, that's redemption. That's reconciliation, propitiation, justification, purification, the cleansing. This is the forgiveness of sin, peace with God, victory in the angelic conflict. Right there. All of that. <laughs> Best part of that 50 things you receive in salvation, they're going to be losing time and eternity. This is the blood that covers your life. This is a symbol of the historical blood of Jesus Christ that covers your life for time and eternity. Nothing. No power over you. But such as the Lord allows. None. 
Can we take that together? Can we salute? Can we be a participant of that truth in our souls? Let's do that. Our Heavenly Father, we know the work has already been done in our life from the cross. He said it is finished. What does this cup do for my life? I took the bread, Father, and I, I took the cup. What, what, what does that do to me? Here's what Paul said it did for him, and I say amen. Listen to what he said. He said, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I want to thank you for that, Father. It's for a proclamation to the world. I stand bold. It's not hard to stand bold inside the church. That's not where the proclamation is declared. With fruit to come. It's a proclamation that begins in the church from the Eucharist. I go to the world and I declare to them that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world and wants to be yours. He went to that cross for you. If he went for no one else, he went for you. If for no other person, he went for Ron Adema from Podunk, Michigan, from a little place nobody knows about except those who live within five or six miles of it. Shelby, Nuera, and Stony Lake. Stony Lake. How is it, Father, that I can see such clearly these truths and others can't? Because I've been born again. And I have the light of revelation in my soul based on the word of God, the most important book in my library, and I have a lot of them. I love to read. Phyllis Breening put that in my soul as a student in her classes. None greater. The book for eternity I have in my library. <laughs> none of the rest of them are going to make it. None of the rest of them are going to make it out of my library. That book's going. That book I'll read again in the library of heaven. What a wonderful thing. Thank you, Father. Thank you for it. So I thank you today for those that have come our way to study with us why Jesus didn't die on Friday, buried on Saturday, and raised on Sunday. Raised on Sunday, yes. First fruits of the resurrection. First fruits of the resurrection. I hope you will go back and study all of this. I've given you a lot of information. A lot of information. You go back to Leviticus 23 and read 4 through 21 and study it. Because everything in the New Testament is based on the fulfillment of it. I've tried to show you that. Let us pray. Father, we're so thankful for these that have come our way and studied with us today. I pray for our people, Father, under the crisis of this COVID-19. We do what we need to do, Father, for the sake of other people. But for us, born again, our life is covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. Nothing is permitted in and out without permission. My body is the temple of God. 1 Corinthians 16, 19 and 20. I know, I behold, my body is the temple of God. It's a mobile church. Because the Holy Spirit lives within my body. And my body is the temple, the naos, the holy of holies of God. My life is covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. My people know this. I hope those around the world that listen to us would come to know this. Study the Bible for yourself. Stop listening to other people who don't give you the whole truth. 
faked, faked preaching like fake news today. They don't give you the whole thing. Study the whole thing and get it. In Jesus' name, amen.